Good morning, everybody. Um, I can't actually see you because of the lights. Uh, thank you for showing up, appearing here in person, uh, even on a chilly morning. Um, we're going to start with a conversation I had uh, with former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Uh, we caught up a few days ago, and he talked about the various challenges confronting the world in the attempt to combat climate change. So without further ado, we'll move ahead with that conversation. I will be joined, hopefully in person, by the Panamanian foreign minister at some point during the video, and we'll be uh, speaking uh, remotely to the other two participants. Mr. Secretary General, the high cost of converting from carbon to green energy is provoking restiveness in some societies. These costs will only rise. So how should governments handle the trade-off between the necessary conversion to carbon neutral economies and the social restiveness that this is causing? The transition from carbon to green energy will not be an easy a transition for many. What is absolutely necessary at this time, it is critical now for government to increase their ambition level, not only in clean energy, uh, but creating millions of new green jobs uh, for the people uh, to, toward the road to net to zero by 2050. Now leaders must conjoin strong climate policy actions uh, with more domestic spendings. Leaders must do better in addressing some of the underlying currents of populist skepticism, as populist skepticism and anger in our societies moving uh, forward. I believe that uh, we need to be more realistic about the uh, winners and losers of globalization and take more decisive action uh, in addressing inequality both um, within and between countries. Uh, fortunately, um, during my time, UN has uh, de adopted sustainable development goals to make sure that nobody is left behind by 2030. Among 17 goals, most important one is number 13 goal, uh, climate change. That is why we just uh, this uh, number 13 goal and put in a treaty-based agreement. This climate change in Paris is legal treaty, legal treaty, which must be implemented in all. That has been my consistent message to uh, world leaders, uh, but I think there should be more. Uh, Mr. Ban, uh, African countries and the developing world in general are not happy with the financial support they receive from the developed world. They say too much is being asked of them. They have too many problems to deal with to go straight to green energy. So how should developed societies address the enormous energy problems in Africa? This is a very important uh, question you are raising. They are the least to, to contribute to this uh, climate phenomena, but the most hit, the biggest hit by this uh, current uh, uh, drought, long spell of drought, agricultural issues and uh, infrastructure issues. Now, we are trying to mobilize uh, $25 billion uh, for five years, coming five years. And AFDB, AFDB has confirmed that they will take uh, half of this uh, $12.5 billion, uh, African Development Bank. And we are asking the uh, United Kingdom as a chair of this uh, COP to mobilize. There will be an African Union meeting. Another one, globally, globally, $100 billion, which had been committed and announced in 2009 during uh, COP15 in Copenhagen when I was the Secretary General. We were very much grateful. Then Secretary Hillary Clinton and the European Union, Japanese, they proudly announced that we will 
uh, mobilize 100 billion dollars up to 2020, and thereafter, thereafter, 100 billion dollars every year. And I've been. And what happened to that? Now, what? is my understanding? I heard. I have not the clear, correct information, but leaders are now talking about this issue. How to? They feel sense of guilty now because they have not done enough. Uh, how to provide 100 billion dollars? This one by 2025, at least we may need 500 billion dollars. These big numbers like 100 billion are thrown around and then the follow-up is lacking. Are the countries serious? The developed world, is the developed world serious in your view about this? Time, about this? They must be. They must be mm -hmm. serious because we have no time to lose. The climate change is happening and approaching and hitting us much, much severely much faster. It will be their political and moral responsibility. President Xi Jinping of China is not coming to Glasgow. Uh, President Biden, of course, is. Uh, how do you assess um, China's attempts to meet the climate change challenge and move toward a more carbon neutral economy? While I am disappointed by the news that President Xi Jinping will not be traveling to uh, Glasgow, I do believe that China understands the importance and seriousness and necessity of elevated multilateral action to address, address our rapidly worsening climate uh, change emergency. Uh, particularly, I commend uh, President Xi for making a public commitment during his uh, September speech at the UN General Assembly that China would uh, stop building coal-fired power stations abroad. Now, my message is that uh, communicating the right message is one thing, and following up uh, with the requisite action uh, is another entirely. And more details on China's uh, 2060 net to zero target are certainly needed. It is critical that all the leaders, world leaders, not only China, but the United States too, and other key stakeholders, raise their ambition and urgency in bridging the gap between rhetoric and commitment. I believe the Paris change, Climate Change Agreement still offers us our best hope. And that is why uh, I hope that uh, China and the United States will fully cooperate on this matter. Tensions between the United States and China have risen pretty sharply. Is it reasonable to expect that these two great powers of the 21st century, if they're confronting each other in so many other areas that I won't go into, that they will actually be able to cooperate in this one critical area of adapting to climate change? I do believe and I do urge the leaders of two countries fully cooperate when it comes to um, a climate issue. Climate issue is not the political one. It's a science. It's a natural disaster issue. Therefore, there will be no, no United States, no China can survive when mm -hmm. We do not act on this. It's a crucial timing for their cooperative relationship. They are most uh, powerful, most resourceful uh, countries in the world. When they work together, I'm sure that uh, we can address this uh, climate change issues. And if uh, they are able to address and harmoniously on this matter, I'm sure that gradually, step by step, they will be able to um, broaden the scope of uh, mutual trust and confidence. That's what I, I expect. Do you actually think, uh, given the progress up to now, that the current targets that are set are realistic or are they too ambitious? I mean, sometimes in life it's better to set a modest target and then exceed it rather than uh, go for something big and fail, which seems to be happening up to now in many instances. So are these targets actually realistic? Nobody said it is easy. 
it is challenging. Uh, but uh, there is a saying that aim high, aim high. But at this time, I think there's a minimum, minimum, which we can really save our planet and our humanity now. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has announced uh, during, uh, through their sixth assessment report last uh, August that global temperature average has risen 1.1 degrees already. You may remember that uh, our target, original target, was to hold global temperature rise, contain global temperature yeah. rise, you know, 1.5 degrees. But WMO, UN WMO, World Meteorological Organization, has also confirmed it that we have already consumed 1.1 degrees. There is a 0.4 degrees remaining. That is why the world now has, has lowered, lowered this uh, barometer by 2040. It's not even by 2050. By 2040, we must contain 1.5 five degrees Celsius by any means. For that, we must invest all science and technology, all necessary financial support. That is the only way which can save our humanity as, as well as our planet. Mr. Ban, finally, um, because all this in the end comes down to human beings, um, uh, what do you say to, uh, let's, let's say, a French worker in some regional town in, in a modest job um, who gets the news that his electricity bill, his gas bill is going to go up. But he has to accept that because the alternative uh, is to continue in a carbon economy and uh, threaten the planet. And so you say to this, this guy, this woman, uh, you know, you have to face this, uh, yeah, costs are going to go up, but the alternative is to lose our planet. Uh, how do, you know, how does somebody like President Macron or any leader uh, handle that? People don't like paying higher bills, and, uh, but they may have to for a while if, if this very ambitious uh, revolution, that's really what it is, um, is going to happen. It's a human tendency, human tendency, human nature. That you don't need to, you don't, nobody wants to pay more for the right. electric bill or energy for their uh, living. Uh, but the reality should be accepted as reality. We are living in a very, very challenging, very difficult situation. Now, all science has made it quite clear that climate change is happening much, much faster now, much, much more seriously. Even some geologists are warning that uh, in 100 years, we may meet the uh, sixth mass extinction. The time for talk is over now. That's my uh, strong message now. Second, mobilize $100 billion. Keep their promise. Keep their promise. Whether they will do it for next year, $100 billion, or they will... It's much better to plan for five-year term like this way. So give sense of hope to many developing countries, poor countries, who do not have any means to address this one. Then I think a bigger and richer countries like the United States and European Union, Japan, I think they should do uh, much more. And my third uh, uh, request is that align the, um, their ambition towards 1.5 degrees. This is uh, very much important. Then fourthly, they must finish and complete the negotiation on rule book. The, this Paris Climate Change Agreement is a broad agreement in, uh, in political and scientific way, broad agreement. There must be some specificities specific rules, they have not yet agreed on rule book. This rule book must be agreed upon this time. Then from next year, we go by rule, we go by the rules, and we go, we expect this uh, political leadership, particularly 
and big powers, United States, China, European Union, Japan, and all these countries, they should lead this campaign. That has been my consistent message during my time as a Secretary General. Now, even as a former Secretary General, uh, I am speaking out, out of my moral, moral responsibility. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General. That's a very firm exhortation to everybody in Glasgow, and I hope uh, that everyone will hear you and act. Thank, yeah, thank you. you very much. For this. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Well, some challenging words there from former Secretary Ban. The time for talk is over. Uh, we're going to try to look today at um, how the global commitment to combating climate change has affected international relations. Has it led to greater competition? Has it brought countries together? And I'm being joined remotely by Hafsat Abiola, who uh, is the co-founder of Connected Women Leaders. Hafsat is from Nigeria. I'm being joined also by Li Shuo, who is the Senior Global Policy Advisor for Greenpeace China. And finally, and hopefully here on stage at some point, uh, Erica Munez, who is the Panamanian Foreign Minister. Um, Hafsat, if I may start with you. Um, I can't actually see you on these screens. Ah, now I can see you. Uh, uh, Hafsat was going to be here, but unfortunately, her passenger locator form was not quite right in the moment, so she's still in Brussels. Uh, these are the times we live in. Um, uh, Hafsat, uh, uh, former Secretary Ban mentioned this famous 100 billion uh, annual, 100 billion dollars of support to Africa and, other, and uh, other areas of the developing world, and the money did not materialize. Uh, how, how, are, how are you feeling about these broken promises, and do you think leaders in the developed world have any credibility left? Thank you. Well, I heard um, the former Secretary General, I had actually um, decided that they did not have any credibility left. You know, they've committed $100 billion, which is not even if it's not, it's a fraction of what is needed. Until today, they've not been able to fulfill on that promise. And you know, you get so tired because they'll gather again at some major event and make a new announcement and not even let us know that they never fulfilled the past ones. You know, so you're dealing with leaders who just go, it's as if it's like a circus. And that every time there's a season when the circus comes to town, and they roll out um, the, the elephants and everything and everybody gets really excited, then they move on. You know, nothing concrete to meet the real challenges on the ground. In Nigeria, they quantified how much we need in just one country in Africa of the 54 countries. It was 500 billion that was quantified that we would need to be at, um, ready to meet the challenge of climate change. So, when, so, so, so when you hear, for example, here already there's been an agreement in principle anyway to uh, end deforestation by 2030, you don't, you don't find that, to you that's words or you actually think it will lead to action? So, you know, I was a member of cabinet in Ogun State, the industrial state in Nigeria for about um, eight years. And while I served there, there was a project that we were working on with Lafarge and some other partners to help with deforestation. We have one of the last original rainforests in Africa, and we were 10 years out to extinction of this um, rainforest. So actually, in the lead up to um, this um, um, conversation, I contacted the people who were driving that project. That was in 2019 when I left that job. And I said, are you, did you finally get this project off the ground? And actually the good news is that they did. So um, I think, you know, my disappointment is that we're too slow. We're too slow. So this project we've been working on from 2017. This is 2021. When I think of Greta, and I think of my two children, and I think of all the children of the world, I just think we can't afford this kind of um, snail-like pace. 
the world urgently needs action, but we're kind of swamped with so much bureaucracy. Uh, who is holding these people accountable to the commitments that they make so that the money is released and the resources are released so we can see action? We need action and we need it faster. You in Africa are, are not responsible for the accumulation of greenhouse gases. That's the responsibility historically primarily of the United States and then other developed powers. And yet in Africa, you're being asked to make these very ambitious commitments to green energy. So is there a feeling that, hey, we didn't create this problem and now we're having to foot this huge bill? Or is there a readiness despite all that to, to try to make this radical adjustment even as Africa grows its energy resources? The truth is that if Africa is to be responsible to Africans, which is our primary responsibility, you know, and when I say to Africans as our primary responsibility, it's with um, clear awareness that we're talking about the poorest people in the world who don't have the means for this adaptation. We have half of our people with, without access to any kind of electricity. Why is that rainforest in Ogun State in Nigeria disappearing? Because people are using firewood from the trees to, to cook. You know, we have to give, we have to, we need global solidarity. I think Africans are more than happy to um, shoulder the, um, a burden that humanity is faced with and the challenge that all of humanity is faced with. But the truth is that our people need the support and the resources to meet that challenge. They're not going, right now in the, off the sea coast in Senegal, the fishermen, um, let, um, they, I don't know how you set off explosives so that the fishes flow to the top because all these big um, um, rich countries come with their big ships and go deep and take all the fish. So for them to in any way find fish to sell, they're essentially um, destabilizing the, the oceans. So what I'm saying is that it's one thing for me to say to you that our governments or our elite are ready to meet this burden, but what about the people who need food, who need energy and they don't have? If, we, if the world wants Africa to be responsible, which we're more than happy to be, then the world needs to be responsible in, in, in how they engage us. And right now they act as if we're begging. Yeah. The money that they have, the wealth that they have, we know how they got it. And if, if their conscience is clear about that, that's up to them. But given the past and the history, if, if there's any conscience left in these wealthy countries, they would be engaging with us and giving us timelines time when the money will come, how quickly it will come. They'll be accountable in a different way. And they'll engage with us as equal partners as, and not as if we're some kind of beggars. Because Thank we're not. Thank you, Hafsa. Well, clear message there that the world absolutely has to step up. Um, well, welcome, Erica. Thank you. I'm glad you made it. I'll turn to you in just a minute. Um, uh, Shaw, uh, if I may now turn to you. Um, here's this big gathering. China is responsible for 28% of the world's emissions, much greater than any other country. And President Xi Jinping chooses not to show up. What should we read into that? Uh, sure, Roger. Um, I think, um, I mean, there's no question, right? I mean, China is uh, the 100 pound gorilla in the room. We are one of the largest economies now in the world. Uh, we are also a leading emitter, uh, as you said, 28% of the global emissions. Um, so I think, the, you know, the country needs to get ready to take more responsibilities. Uh, we've sent some emerging political desire to embrace the climate agenda over the last decade. Uh, I think that, that has been driven by three factors. Number one, um, I think increasingly the country sees taking climate action is actually in itself economic interest. Taking climate action is good for the economy, and it is also part of the larger agenda to transform uh, you know, the Chinese economy to a less carbon and energy intensive one. Number two, uh, we faced severe air pollution challenges over the last decade. And I think that environmental driver has also propelled some action uh, that you know, are benefit, you know, beneficial to mitigate uh, carbon emissions. And I think the third factor is uh, political or diplomatic. Uh, China sees the climate agenda 
as one issue uh, to help manage its relationship with other big powers in the world, but also to project a more uh, positive image uh, on the global stage. Um, but that said, um, China's answer or China's contribution uh, to the Glasgow uh, you know, climate conference has been rather modest, I have to say. Um, we uh, enhanced. I mean, you, you talked about you talked about you talked about diplomacy. Uh, how is it diplomatic for the leader of this emergent great power of the 21st century? Uh, how is it diplomatic for him to say, "Sorry, guys, I'm not coming." For sure. Uh, I, think I mean, doesn't that, that send you know, a, doesn't that send rather a signal of? Uh, more of confrontation than cooperation. I, I may be missing something. Sure, I think you know your your audience needs to uh, understand one important background, uh, which is the Chinese president since since the outbreak uh, of the uh, of the pandemic has now traveled abroad, um, and he is now expected to go anywhere abroad in the foreseeable future. And right. this has nothing to do. Uh, with uh, climate change, whether he cares about it or not, mm -hmm. but simply because of uh, safety and pandemic control reasons. So there is, um, not a, there is not an isolationist turn in China. Some people are perceiving one. No, I think, I think that's probably reading too much into it. And I think a lot of people are also still trying to clarify whether a virtual participation option mm -hmm. was indeed uh, possible or provided by the uh, host of COP26. Mm -hmm. And if not, then the only other possible option is for China to participate by the meeting right. in a written statement, which was indeed what China did. How, how should we interpret the mixed message from China? It set some ambitious targets in terms of going carbon neutral. At the same time, it's building coal-powered energy plants like there's no tomorrow. So which is it? Well, I think, uh, you know, I, I take China's commitment, for example, to completely decarbonize right, before 2060 as actually uh, the country following the uh, growing global consensus. If we look across the globe, more and more countries are embracing that ambition. It is one of the most important things enshrined in the Paris Agreement. So I see that uh, as progress, both domestic, at, you know, here in China, but also internationally. And if we look at what happened, uh, when, you know, when China made the carbon neutrality announcement last September, this means in less than a month, Japan and Korea made similar commitments. So you can also see the role of China in contributing to the, uh, to the global momentum by bringing others with it. But on the other hand, you are absolutely right. We fall short when it comes to our near-term action. I mean, there's no way for us to truly achieve carbon neutrality if we do not decarbonize from tomorrow. Right? When it comes to the climate challenge, uh, I think people need to understand it is a time bound environmental problem. Uh, so we cannot delay all the action to 30 or 40 years away from now. We need to act tomorrow. And we are not doing enough on that front. So, so you think it's a mistake to build these coal-powered plants? Well, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I don't think there is any room for coal here in China or, frankly, in any other major economies in the world in the 2020s. I think, I think that field needs to be put into, into, into history. It has, frankly, already generated a lot of financial problems in China as well as air pollution problems. Okay. Um, well, hi, Erica. Thanks. Thanks for not leaving me alone on stage here. I was, I was getting a little worried. Um, maybe, uh, I mean, Panama, uh, let, let's talk about the ocean for a moment. I mean, is there, you've been very active uh, in that area, and uh, clearly if global warming continues, uh, a country like Panama, if the waters rise, it's not going to be good by any means. Uh, so has that been a, a major... Thank you. The, the ocean is certainly one of our priorities. Good? 
Okay, um, the, the, it's one of our priorities, but not just in rhetoric or saying or nice speeches that we all heard. I, I think that Panama single-handedly delivered the two biggest breakthroughs of the COP. We signed yesterday an alliance with Bhutan and Suriname. So the three countries, Panama, Suriname, and Bhutan, are the only countries in the world that are carbon negative. They've delivered their inventory. We emit less carbon. Yesterday, uh, we emit uh, less carbon than the one that our forests capture. Um, to me, when we talk about oceans, so if Panama can do it, we have the, one of the main waterways of the world, the Panama Canal. Um, our economy depends on services. I mean, so you have between Bhutan, Suriname, and Panama, different geographies, different economies, all of us being able to deliver, not the parties, small, small, countries. small countries, but um, we have different ways, uh, our economies depend differently, our energy matrix, et cetera, but we all take in extremely bold measures. Uh, we have over 33 of our land area protected. Um, and not only that, so when you ask, so how is that impacting us? So the Panama Canal is now incurring an over $1 billion project to manage the result or the effects, the negative effects of, of climate change. So uh, you have on one hand, one country doing more than its part, so going beyond Paris Agreement targets. So when you hear uh, countries talking about, well, I'm gonna be carbon neutral in 2030 or 2050 or even 2070, where that and beyond now. So that's one thing. And the second one's very specific on oceans. So last June, we declared the protection of 30% of our oceans. And that is extremely important because we sit at a part where it's a hotspot for biodiversity. Uh, for instance, out of the seven marine turtles in the world, five lay their eggs in Panama. Uh, whales from both poles come to Panama as well, two countries in the world. So we were able to deliver that in June, but yesterday we got Ecuador, Colombia, and Costa Rica to support us, making this a huge and beautiful protected marine corridor in the Pacific, the largest in fact. So that's actual action. Um, not just words, but actually making sure that there is no illegal fishing, that there is enough time for them to regrow those uh, biodiversity that it's in, in the marine life. So. Mm -hmm. Eric, if I may, I mean, when you take this action and then you look south to a country like Brazil, mm -hmm. you're engaging in reforestation, and we all know under President Bolsonaro what is happening in, in the rainforest. I mean, what, what would your message to Brazil be? Well, our message to the world, uh, yeah. and at this COP in particular, it, we're looking... Well, let, let's look at South America for, one, for a minute. I mean, what... What do you think of what's going on in the continent? Well, <laughs> there is a yeah. huge responsibility and yeah. not enough action. And when we hear about the plans for 2030 or 2050, we want to hear a plan for next year. So we want to come to the COP next year right. and be able to have some form of accountability for everybody. Not hear about plans and not hear about recommitment, but hear about what have I done? So what, there should be a milestone, a, current, a, a schedule for January, February. What are we doing rather than this sort of bold but very abstract plan? Right. Thank you. Um, I said, I, I want to ask a, a general question to all of you just to get a quick answer. I mean, I live in France, and uh, as part of getting to a carbon neutral economy by 2050, President Macron has just recommitted. Uh, France currently gets 67% of its electrical power roughly from nuclear power plants, by far the biggest in Europe. And President Macron has just recommitted nuclear as one of the means to achieve these targets in 2050. What's your take on nuclear? And I'd like to ask that question to all three of you, one after the other. Just a quick, quick answer. Um, starting with you, Hafsat. Well, I don't really support the energy, but you know, I did um, my university in, in the US and I was with a lot of um, you know, Pacific type people especially on the West Coast. And so maybe I am just very biased, but um, I just don't believe in that source of energy. I think we can use other sources of energy. So I'm not in favor of nuclear energy. Thank you. Sure? 
Well, I agree with uh, Hafsad. I mean, uh, you ask Greenpeace about nuclear, you got a pretty uh, predictable answer. I mean, just look at uh, Fukushima, right? I mean, that happened in our neighborhood, not too far away from China. And I think that um, it, it, it taught everybody a lot, right? So it's certainly not, not favorable, certainly not supportive to uh, the further growth of the nuclear sector. And I, look, I think the truth is when we talk about transitioning from the fossil fuel based economy and energy system, we have the solutions. Renewable energy, wind and solar, the cost is getting down, the technology we have there. But we're not talking about uh, you know, finding some kind of uh, you know, rocket science to support us to fully decarbonize. We have those technologies readily available with us now. Any thoughts on that, Erica? Yeah, I would only add, and I, and I agree with the previous comments, that um, so in order to transition your energy matrix, there is a cost-efficient manner that sometimes is not very green and not very eco-friendly. Yeah. And we have to take the hard path and understand that un ultimately it's sustainability. So even if it might be more expensive at the beginning, mm -hmm. it, it ends up being better for the planet mm -hmm. and more sustainable and more economic mm -hmm. at the end. So sometimes, especially now as we come out of this uh, economic recession, there's the problem or the potential fallback that, that countries will look to a, a cheaper way mm -hmm. uh, in terms of getting their fuel, and that might not be the most eco-friendly way of doing it. Uh, we're talking about um, cooperation and competition here, uh, and inevitably the pandemic has been isolating. Relations between China and the United States are very tense. Uh, we have a war in Ethiopia. Uh, a lot of global tensions. Um, I, I'm going to go to questions uh, from our audience after this, but um, Afsat, starting with you, do you see a, a more antagonistic world? This is a global problem, of course, climate change. It can only be addressed globally. But how can you address a global problem if the level of tensions, confrontation, antagonism, disagreement uh, is growing globally? So how do you see that issue? Uh, is it unrealistic? at a time of growing confrontation. And even yesterday, President Biden had some very critical remarks to make about the non-appearance of President Xi Jinping that will not go down well in Beijing. So how do you see it? Um, if the three of you could give me an answer of that, on that, please. Um, actually, I'll start with Erica this time and end with Hafsat, and then we'll go to questions. I think that uh, it used to be in terms of geopolitics that the two factors were trade and security. And now we have climate. And the difference or the particular interesting aspect of climate, as you mentioned, is no one state can solve it on its own. Right. So you depend on others and the cooperation remains key. And at this critical time, uh, we have to put aside, and that may be easy to say, but when you come, in, and I am the Minister of Foreign Affairs, I can tell you firsthand, it, it, climate change right now is one of the main topics, if not the main, for Panama is one of the main topics. But how you actually address that through cooperation, and how do you make sure when you were asking me, because Panama clearly is doing more than its fair share, but how are we getting others to contribute, because we're losing complete islands, we're losing complete area of our coast because of the climate change, yet how can we affect what others are doing, particularly as uh, the U.S. and China engage in, 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 in this conflict? I mean, do your counterparts respond positively? Uh, you know, there are big powers like Russia that are pretty dismissive of climate change. You know, hey, if you're in Russia, it's going to, you know, global warming will open up some of the Arctic sea routes. That kind of thing. Are, are people responsive or are they dismissive I, when I, you meet your counterparts? No, I think that the, the, there has been clearly a change um, in the way, even in your agenda, when you sit and you meet with counterparts. It used to not be a topic, and when we brought it up, it was like, yeah, dismissive. Yeah. Now, it's certainly a part okay. that, that people address and want to continue exploring. Yes. Okay, just very quickly, please, Shua and said on the issue of trying to solve a global problem at a time of growing confrontation in other areas. Possible or not? Well, I would, uh, I would certainly think so. And I think uh, you know, the way that I would answer your question, Roger, uh, intentionally provocative, I, I would actually challenge 
that, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, growing tension around the world uh, does not mean we cannot do more on climate action. I mean, I, I, I agree it complicates global climate politics, but on the other hand, uh, I think the biggest barrier uh, now that we have in the global climate system is that um, we, we, we face a globally collective lack of energy. Um, I think the, the prerequisite for all the countries to do it is that they have the trust that others are doing it at the same time. And that's exactly the dynamic uh, you know, of the Soviet Union and, and Russia kind of reducing the war had. It is not because these two countries are the best friends in the world. It is because when Russia does it, reducing war had, they knew that the United States would do so and vice versa. And we don't have that dynamic in between the U.S. and China. The, 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 you know, the Chinese side is very skeptical in terms of how far Biden can go, and the U.S. would have the same skepticism towards China. And so that's, I think that's the real issue, that's the real barrier. And to address that barrier, I think all the countries need to turn into their domestic system and think about, you know, how they can really incentivize climate action through, through creating better domestic political conditions instead of looking at others and their shortfalls. Hafsa. So what I would say is that um, coming from the African continent, we really can't afford, um, we have a saying that when two elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. And we will hate to be the grass between, uh, uh, in a fight between the United States and China, <laughs> where in fact, not just that we would not like that situation, we don't really have to have that situation. We have no um, space given the challenges that we already face in terms of creating jobs. By 2030, we're gonna have 25% of the world's labor force. We don't have work for them even now that they're 15 percent. We just don't have time for the um, big fight between who is number one or number two and all of that. And we don't want to get involved in that. We, we actually need the United States, President Biden, cooperating with President Xi Jinping of China. We, and and we, we, we don't see why it's not possible. We hope that they can be mature and cooperate and help the world because I'm not sure that um, the kind of challenges that we face um, can be resolved while such major powers as the United States and China are in conflict. Thank you very much. Um, Jay, do we have any questions from the global audience? Um, We have some questions from the virtual audience. Firstly, how far are we from achieving the level of commitment needed to truly address the climate crisis? And what more can we do to deliver that commitment? What are the key levers that we need to activate? And then... Okay, look, I think one at a time. So how do we, how do we get the necessary... Did you hear the question? It was, you know, how do we actually practically, pragmatically secure uh, the necessary commitment. Otherwise, it's blah, blah, right? It's just blah, blah. <laughs> yes, um, I, I think that um, it is not the commitment, but what kind of commitment we're doing. I think we all come here and we, uh, we've heard 2030, 2050, but it doesn't really translate into a specifics. As I mentioned before, the short-term action plan. So when we look at COP, we're not coming. We should have the COPs to say what you have done, not what you plan to do. Right now, it's sort of looking forward, and it almost seems like the whole point is the conference. This is not the whole point. It's not to come to the conference. So there should be accountability. There, there should, should be, be a monitoring. lot more accountability, monitoring, monitoring and, yeah. and some form of, yes, yeah. so we can all look at each other and see how we're doing, yes. Okay, uh, Jay, next question. And then if there's anyone in the audience who has a question, please just, there's a gentleman at the back. So I'll take one more remote question uh, and then maybe the gentleman there, yeah. So relatedly, in his conversation with Roger earlier, Ban Ki-moon spoke about the need for countries participating in the COP this year to agree upon a rule book for implementing climate commitments. How likely do you feel that that outcome is? What should the rule book look like and how might it be enforced? Uh, Hafsa, uh, can you uh, put together a quick rule book for us? 
a rule book on how to monitor and hold countries accountable for actually delivering on all these words, five minutes to midnight, the bomb's about to go <laughs> off. You know, everybody's looking for a, a, the next cliche that describes you know, where we are. But, but what, about, what about just holding people to account? What's the rule book look like? I think that we can use technology to create this. You know, with technology, we can quickly have a, a, a list of all the commitments and then just track them and have citizens of the different countries track where their leaders are. You know, every time I, I was just in the wonderful country of Spain last week at the invitation of their government, and then a lot of the young people that we met were asking how can they support African countries. Really, the biggest way to support African countries is to get the governments in the different countries to meet commitments. You know, so engage with your own government. You know, people should engage directly and put pressure. And actually, I think that there needs to be a reallocation of resources because they often say there's no money, but we know that there's trillions of dollars to solve the pandemic. If, they, if there's a commitment, we find the money. And actually, we spend $4 billion a day on defense all over the world. So if we wanted to um, um, give $100 billion to the poorer countries of the world, that's 25 days of um, defense spending. There is money. So we just have to begin to organize and mobilize towards direct action that produces a certain result. That's a very powerful statistic on defense spending and uh, what giving that $100 billion a year would actually comparatively represent. Thank you for that. The gentleman at the back there, please, if we have a mic for him. Uh, do we? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists for a wonderful discussion. Uh, my question is actually for Erica. We were delighted yesterday to hear about the agreement between uh, Panama, Bhutan, and Suriname. And we work very closely in Bhutan. And so I know that in Bhutan, there carbon negativity relies heavily on large forest cover, so 70%, approximately 70% coverage of forest cover. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about uh, the equation that has led to Panama's carbon negativity. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Um, we have a couple of things that we've done. Our energy matrix depends heavily on renewables. We have the protection of 33% of our forests, and we also have certain land protected for indigenous communities, which are at the ones, one of the main keepers of the world of all the protected areas. So all of that together has led us to be carbon negative. And, and as I mentioned- what, what percentage of your energy matrix is renewables? 60, I believe it's 60%. And that's grown from what? Well, it's grown over the years, and we're now even transitioning even further. We're in, including, for instance, cars, the hybrid cars. So we're doing like a full energy uh, transition towards 2030. So we continue. It's not only to get to your own target, in our case, being carbon negative, but you have to continue and to sustain. And the sustainability, as, as, as she was mentioning, uh, there is a lot in terms of monitoring, surveillance, because it's not just protecting your area. You have to pay and make sure that you have the resources to surveil all the areas so they are not in incurring in deforestation, in illegal fishing, etc. Was there another question at the back there? It's hard to see with the lights. Yes, sir. Hi, good, good morning. Uh, my question is about the localness of geopolitics here and the influence on these uh, decisions. So I chair the Environment Agency in Scotland and we have relationships with EPAs around the world. I'm really uh, stuck with the difference between what I see every day in equal measure with our industries where there are good examples of uh, tackling climate change and in equal measure are really bad examples. Now, as we in very, very local, even much more local than those great examples from Panama, how do we connect and does local matter or are we simply waiting for the big decision makers to make something of the $100 billion that hasn't been uh, spent in a real way? Does local matter and if so, how to force the pace of change? Um, I think Shuo has left us. Uh, Hafsa, the question was about we're talking about the big decisions by global leaders, but the question is about how can, how, how can local networks uh, coordinate and cooperate to make the right decisions in terms of getting to a carbon neutral 
economy. This gentleman is working at the local level and he sees good things happening around him and he sees bad things happening around him. So how do we push forward the good things and reduce the number of bad things? We actually think that um, the, the hope is in the local. And the I hope think is in the, the local, I like that. That's a good slogan, the hope is in the local. Yeah. And the hope is in connecting, you know. You see, the, in the end, um, what's going to make the big difference for the planet is to create an alternative. You know, the politicians can only work with what is there. Um, if, there's, if we have not created, think of the politician as somebody on, in, um, that is like kind of standing on some kind of body of water, maybe a submarine. And, um, and we have to create the islands that they can stand on um, to move in a, in a, in a, um, it forward. So those local initiatives that the gentleman spoke about, those are the islands that they're going to stand on because they can't stand on nothing. So we have to create these new spaces, new, like the, like the lady from Panama. It was so inspiring to listen to her. And frankly, I think that they're just three countries, but their model is an inspiration to other countries. And so I'm hoping that maybe by next year, we should have 20. And then by the following year, maybe 40. And it's like this. Maybe in a few years, we can get to 150, and then that will be the critical mass. Who knows? But you know, we, have, we need concrete things to make a difference. OK, I've got to end this. But sure, very quickly, as you work for Greenpeace in China, I mean, what about local networks? How do you coordinate with uh, other NGOs, organizations around the world at a local level to propel things in a way so that the leaders have to take note? Well, I think rather a good uh, you know, example of our work is um, just generating the public attention and momentum about 10 years ago on the issue of air pollution here in China. I mean, we face severe challenges. Um, and you know, what happened a decade ago was just a lot of environmental groups uh, you know, started to pay attention to this issue uh, you know, build public momentum awareness so that, you know, this issue uh, was really elevated to the level that the politicians cannot uh, look away from. Um, and, you know, 10 years have, uh, have already passed. Uh, we still have a lot of, you know, environmental and air pollution problems, but things have also improved quite a bit. And along the way, um, you know, at least, at, you know, on a regional basis, so, you know, some parts of China have reduced its reliance on coal. And that's, of course, also creating climate benefits. So I guess that's just a, a good example of where kind of local action and, in, you know, the work of environmental groups can actually, um, you know, uh, contribute to the global effort of combating climate change. Well, thank you all very much. Um, uh, I like the idea, Eric, that you could be you know, leading the way that we'll go from three countries to a much greater number next time around. Thank you all. Thank you for ending on a somewhat hopeful note. Thank you all for being here for this opening session. And uh, uh, with that, I'll bring it to a conclusion. Thank you.